This is episode 29 of the Andrew Hines Real Estate Investing Podcast. Welcome to episode 29 of the Andrew Hines Real Estate Investing Podcast. I have Jeff Woods on the show today, and Jeff Woods is a very accomplished real estate investor. He started in his early 20s investing, did not come from a family that ever invested in real estate, but he built himself into a person, and he talks about this in the podcast, the type of person that he needed to be to acquire 250 rental units. Jeff has used both joint ventures and private money to get where he's gotten today, and he credits a lot of his teachers for teaching him what he needed to know to be able to grow to the point that he's at. Jeff has aspirations of eventually retiring into South America and running a business similar to the business that he runs here in Ontario, both coaching and investing in a large number of units. He was also nice enough to share examples of deals he's done and how much money he's made both flipping and in just negotiating a good deal. Jeff is a fan of creativity and of course learning that which he does not know. So be sure to grab a pen and a paper for this one. If you're sitting, if you're driving, then just take it in and, and maybe give it another listen later on because this is a good one. Without further ado, here is Jeff Woods. Hello and welcome to the Andrew Hines Real Estate Investing Podcast. I have Jeff Woods on the show today and uh, Jeff is uh, sort of known as Yoda in the real estate investing <laughs> industry. I've heard his name many times through mutual acquaintances. Never met him, just uh, saw, saw I had him on Facebook and messaged him, said, hey, come on over, let's uh, let's shoot a podcast. So this is uh, Jeff's book. It's called The uh, Ultimate Wealth Strategy, and I'm sure we'll talk a little bit about that and uh, many more things. So first off, Jeff, welcome to the show and thanks for coming. Thanks. It's a pleasure to be here, Andrew. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm really looking forward to the interview. So we both know Koken, who was on one of the episodes yes. uh, before. And then uh, I know that uh, Spencer, you had mentioned, you would, you know as well, Spencer Gatton. So yeah. a couple of guys that uh, I kind of met through the meetup and through kind of starting this podcast and some networking, which has uh, uh, been a pretty cool experience. But um, why don't you just take me through? So I, I've intentionally not done my uh, my back research on you because I wanted it to be more authentic as we kind of ask these questions and kind of sure. learn about you. Yeah. Uh, I do know uh, Quentin D'Souza. I've met him before and I have seen your book before. I think I told you, I, I think I have a copy of this. Awesome. But um, why don't you just start with uh, your story? How'd you get into real estate? When'd you get in? Uh, give me your, uh, your elevator pitch and then we'll go from there. Yeah. So I, I started investing when I was 23 years of age. So come from relatively humble beginnings and, uh, you know, went the traditional route of moving to Niagara and going to college, uh, quickly figured out that I did not want to become a correctional officer. That's what I was going through to be. Oh, really? And, um, of course had bad habits and debt and not very good credit and struggling and, you know, OSAP loans and all that wonderful stuff. And, um, had to quickly figure out how to uh, take care of myself and pay my rent. So there was a couple things that happened uh, around that time that piqued my curiosity around real estate. One was um, a late night infomercial by uh, a gentleman named Carlton Sheets, okay. uh, who, was, who was selling a no money down deals back in the day. So that kind of piqued my curiosity and that combined with figuring out how am I gonna pay the rent on the townhouse that I rented to go to school. And so I quickly had filled those rooms as well as the basement to to collect rental income to pay the landlord. And uh, so through that, I quickly figured out that, hey, you know, rather than paying all this rent money to the landlord, how can I get involved in real estate? And so it uh, that's what piqued the curiosity and um, the idea of exploring real estate further. And then I was able to around that time, the casino industry was coming to Niagara Falls. And okay. one of my roommates had wanted to uh, become a dealer. And so I ended up taking a dealing course with him, ended up getting a job at the casino, saved up all my money and bought a beat up uh, bank power of sale at the time and uh, moved into there and slowly fixed it up. I had three bedrooms up and three bedrooms down that I rented to college and university uh, students. In Niagara? Uh, this property was in Thorold, Ontario. Thorold, okay. So yeah. near the university. Yeah, close to Brock and not too far yeah. to the Niagara campus, uh, the Niagara and the Lake campus as well. Okay. So started to uh, fill that up with students and it cash flowed amazing. And I thought uh, 
real estate was was the way to go and that I was a genius and had it all figured out and um, quickly took all that cash flow and savings and, and uh, did it again and quickly discovered that real estate is not so easy. I ended up buying a duplex in downtown Niagara Falls that uh, and I pretty much made any mistake you can think of, you know, bad area, bad neighborhood, bad tenants, bad foundation, you know, fire code issues. So you weren't you weren't educated <laughs> in like what to look for in a property. At That's the time. right. Yeah, I was just kind of um, winging it. Right. And uh, because my first deal had gone so well, I assumed that the rest would follow suit. And uh, that unfortunately wasn't the case. So um, that deal, well, at the time was a, a nightmare for me. Looking back in hindsight, it's one of the best deals I've ever done because it taught me so many valuable mm -hmm. lessons. And unfortunately, I had to learn the hard way. What did it cost you? If, do you? Do you remember like what you were in for, for damages on, on some of the stuff that went wrong? As far as like the overall repair and maintenance of it, um, I don't remember the exact figures at the time because that was in around 2002. But I know I quickly uh, employed a realtor and said, sell this thing, like get me out so of this. So you just got out of it. Yeah, get me out Didn't of this Didn't fix deal. it, you just got out of it. Well, yeah. I, I fixed what I had to at the time. Um, some of the things, right? But it was yeah. way beyond what I was capable of and my knowledge and my skill set at the time. So I just got out of the deal. And I think the only thing I did right with that deal was I bought it right. It was a private off-market deal and I got it for a really good price. So at the end of the day, I ended up making about $9,000 total. But if you calculate like all the time and investment I put into yeah. it, it was really a loss, right? So yeah, I can, I can relate to getting in kind of over, uh, over your head. Uh, I know when I got started, I bought, you know, properties that just structurally weren't great. You know, the, the exact same thing that you're describing, like saggy floors, weak foundations, you know, parts of crumbling where I, you know, I just didn't know what to look for. And, um, I, as I got further into this, I started to realize, you know, okay, I don't want those things. I want a solid, you know, a solid structure, but um, one particular story of, you know, kind of just getting in over my head was when I actually invested in the U.S. And okay. I, uh, I uh, bought a duplex, beautiful duplex, like overlooking a river in Youngstown, Ohio. And I went down, saw it with my own eyes, and I had a property manager lined up. And it was one of those too good to be true, like 17, 18 cap uh, rentals that, uh, you know, I would make great cash flow on, on buying something for $12,000. And um, I ended long and short, I ended up investing money in it and, you know, just mistakes in, in kind of being green, like trusting property managers. And uh, long and short of that was I actually ended up getting sent pictures of the fan blades in that apartment. Uh, it, it had flooded. The fan blades literally sagged. They, they, they actually had an arc to them. They were wooden fan blades and they, right. they were so moist and so moldy. Like I actually ended up giving the house away. It cost me about 40 G's. Oh, and wow. uh, yeah, that was my my burn, you know, in the first year of investing in real estate that happened. Well, I got into that one. And, uh, you know, I guess that maybe goes to show and maybe you can shed some light on kind of what you would recommend for people. But when you go pedal to the metal and you don't know what you're doing, bad things can happen. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, so it's interesting to see that even after going through all of that adversity, it didn't completely scare you away from from real estate i had see this is this it actually did for a little bit like okay. i was i was going gung-ho that happened in conjunction with a development project i tried to take on and i i uh, made the front page of the london free press with like 40 people standing on my front lawn saying not in our backyard and uh, i had this proposal to build a duplex and it would have been great and would have made money and um another one ended up costing me money at the same time so i i but luckily i had really good people around me that kind of eventually pulled me out of this but i took about a two-year hiatus from real estate just stopped trying to invest stopped trying to do anything yeah and then realized what the hell am i doing and uh, and got back in but yeah it did sort of get me out of the game which i mean i think that would happen to a lot of people and Absolutely. if i hadn't had such good influences and and you know my mother-in-law's you know, a, a, a really accomplished real estate investor. If I hadn't been seeing, you know, people all around me doing it still and saying, why, why did I stop? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, you know, and I've made it back in spades now, right? Like the, those, those burns, 
if you're willing to to stick it through as you know or, yeah you, yeah you know eventually eventually it does really pay off because you learn from it yeah and that's your story is very similar to mine you know after going through that deal i i um uh, you know never wanted to invest in real estate again and i took a, a long period of time off before i did uh another deal right because mm-hmm. it, it, it really shook my confidence and my ability and you know made me question mm-hmm. can i do this is real estate the thing for me and you know over time i was able to rebuild the courage and i knew deep down inside yeah. i didn't want to work for somebody else i wanted to you know break out of the poverty cycle that my family had gone through and um and create wealth and financial independence for myself so i knew there had to be a way but it was just going yeah. through my own personal belief system and my mindset and then getting back in the game but approaching it uh, in a much more intelligent manner and surrounding myself with people that had done it before me you know going to networking groups with experienced investors and hiring coaches that were experienced that had accomplished what i wanted to do Mm -hmm. and then learning through them so that i didn't have to repeat the same mistake yeah i'm big on that i'd rather just copy somebody who did it right and and a coach, I've never had a coach formally, but I, I can totally see the value of somebody that would, would keep you accountable, you know, call you the next day or, or, you know, the next time you talk to them, you feel like you're going to let them down if you didn't do anything, if you didn't take that next step. Yeah, that's a big part of it, right? Where, you know, self-education is very important and books and podcasts and, you know, programs um, are all wonderful and can certainly help uh, guide you in the right direction. But I think the, the benefit to coaching is having somebody there that can really meet you where you are, like with your belief system, your challenges, your credit rating, your finances, mm-hmm. and, and help you in real time navigate what's going on, not only in real estate and building the portfolio, but what's going on in your personal life as well. Yeah. Because if you've got issues there, that's going to impact your ability to become a great real estate investor too. And I know that was certainly true for me, like a lot of, um, you know, self-defeating habits and beliefs that I had built up Mm -hmm. by um, being raised, you know, in my personal circumstances. Um, You know, once I was able to overcome that, I was able to become a better investor. Now, do you mind kind of taking me into the you before you you got into real estate, you know, childhood, like kind of you mentioned that you didn't come from this life. You didn't have financial independence when when you no. were a kid. Probably your parents didn't have that. That's right. Um, is, did that fuel you and how did it fuel you? Yeah, it did. You know, there's some people are born into families where, you know, they can look to their parents as role models as to what to do in life. Right. Like, mm-hmm. here's how you become successful in business, real estate, whatever it is. For me, I had parents that taught me what not to do, Mm -hmm. right? Just just through watching them. I knew that, you know, them going through bankruptcy, divorce, uh, alcoholism, you know, and everything that goes around with that, bouncing from apartment to apartment because there was no stability. I didn't know what I wanted to do at the time, but I knew definitely what I didn't want, right? And so that really fueled me and and motivated me to you know basically cut all ties leave the small little town that i grew up in and go out and and figure it out and i knew it could be done i just didn't know anybody that had done it right so it was really dealing with my personal issues and connecting with those right individuals that could guide me and teach me and mentor me okay and who did you find? How did you find that that first person? I know you said you watched an infomercial. Did you end up signing up for a coaching program? Well, I, it wasn't a coaching program. At the time, it was um, you ordered like a program, right? And it came, yeah. it was a big binder and it came with like uh, 12 cassettes. It was actually cassettes. It wasn't even CDs back then, right? In the early 2000s? <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. It was, I, I still have it. Um, but yeah, it was, it was that that, but again, it was a lot of American based, right? And then yeah. 401ks and section eight housing and, you know, 1031 yep. exchanges that, you know, back then I had no clue what that was or if we it, had those. Yeah. Or if, and it was even applicable to us here yeah. in Canada. So it, it created more confusion than anything. Yeah. But when I was able to um, connect with local Canadian investors and networking groups, 
um, that's when I was able to meet the right connections. And, um, and then just joining other programs, one of which was uh, T. Harv Eckert, who, The okay. Secret of the Millionaire Mind. Yeah. Uh, so I met a gentleman at one of his seminars uh, that became one of my first coaches, and he had a background in real estate and kind of took me under uh, his wing and taught me a little bit as well. So Okay. So you, you started out, was that right around when you were starting out, you bought that first property or is that? No, this was, after? this was several years after. So several I bought, after. I bought my first property. I was uh, 23 years old. It was in 1998. Okay. Um, and then the second one uh, shortly thereafter. And then of course that rocked my confidence. I was out of the game yeah. for quite a while. Uh, it wasn't until around uh, 2005 to 2007 that I really started to reach out to networking groups and mentorship and coaching and programs yeah. started to invest in my education. And Pro were you working full time at the time? Yeah, I was at the casino. So store. you're working, dealing at the casino. Yeah, yeah. But I had, I had this broke mindset of, you know, I didn't want to pay somebody. Mm -hmm. I, I thought I could figure it out on my own and I thought it was a waste of money. And so I was yeah. overcoming all of that as well. And then when I was able to slowly start investing and seeing a return on that investment, um, that was huge. So in 2007 was when everything really started to skyrocket for me. So I went from a small struggling portfolio of uh, a few doors and from 2007 to 2013, I was able to acquire over a hundred rental units in a six year period. 100 rental units. How many buildings is that spread over? Uh, I Approx. think approximately 45. About 45 buildings. Um, okay, so you've got a, so mostly like triplexes, duplexes, things like that? Yeah, yeah. It was a lot of triplex, duplex, some single family, mm -hmm. some townhomes. Uh, and then slowly over time, we evolved into uh, bigger deals, 10 unit apartment buildings, 17 unit apartment buildings, okay. uh, mixed use commercial buildings. And our largest commercial deal is about 15,000 square feet, uh, four-story medical office okay. facility. Um, so it's scaled over time. But it was that uh, six-year period that where things really started to kick in and the momentum grew. If you had to summarize your main strategy to grow, because as we both know, if you're using your own money every time, you eventually run out of down payments. How are you able to acquire so many units? So what I did, I'll back up and just share kind of like my TSN turning point. Okay. So I was at a, a real estate event in Toronto and oh. I, I received a letter in the mail and it was for a real estate event. I wanted to go, sounded good. Everything in the messaging was exactly what I wanted. Uh, the challenge was I had a day job. I was at the casino. I had to work weekends. It was a weekend event. I couldn't go. I also didn't have mm -hmm. the money. Um, so I had a decision to make. So ultimately what I did is I called in sick to work and I put the cost of the seminar on my credit card and uh, went to the event. So I'm a little bit um, reserved, introverted uh, naturally. So I'm there. I'm excited to learn and grow. I'm investing my education, mm -hmm. but I'm at the back of the room, not really saying much and kind of just taking it all in. And the speaker's up at the front of the room and he's bouncing them around and he's a ball of energy and he starts talking about mindset and being a visionary yeah. and creating vision boards and i'm at the back of the room and i'm just thinking to myself this is bullshit i spent all this money all this time this effort to be here called in sick to work right and i've got this story in my head and i've got some freaking guy up there who's talking about vision boards and cutting out pictures and and i'm like if i wanted to join arts and crafts that's what i would have done like i'm here to learn about real estate let's let's get yeah. to the real estate and but it was in that moment where I, I had a paradigm shift and I just started thinking, you know what, Jeff, you've tried to do everything yourself and everything a certain way and it hasn't worked. Mm -hmm. So here's a guy who has the success that you want and he's telling you to do this. So yeah. why don't you just surrender to your belief system and ultimately do what he says? And so essentially what I did is I. I took it to heart. I wrote out my vision. I did the vision board. And as part of that vision, and you know, he was saying, think big. And so for me back at the, at that point in my life, big to me was a hundred doors. And I thought, wow, if I could have a hundred units, 
by the time I'm 65, because at the time I believed, you know, you retire at 65. So I set the goal of 100 units and my own company and self uh, sufficient, self employed, traveling the world, property mm -hmm. down south, right? Uh, did everything he said. And within six years, I had crushed the, the goal of 100 doors. Um, wow. So. So, yeah, so I thought, hmm, there's something to this vision and this mindset. And what happened for me was the, the more I worked on myself, the more confidence I gained and, and um, the more knowledge I gained, the better I was able to do in real estate. So that was the really the, the primary thing that allowed me to achieve the success as I became an individual who could handle a portfolio yeah. like that versus learning all the strategy yeah. without the confidence to do so. Yes. So that's the first part of what I did. Now I took that in conjunction with, and I write about it in the book. So the way I was able to do that so quickly was basically combining uh, two strategies. One of which is, buying, fixing, refinancing, and renting real estate, which I like so to... The burr. Well, you guys didn't call it that then probably, but... Yeah, uh, yeah. So yeah. buy, fix, refinance, and yeah. rent um, is kind of what I refer to it as. And so it was combining that strategy, and I describe it as kind of a hybrid between buy and hold and flipping. Yes. Right? And so that delivered the best of both worlds. You got the long-term buy and holds for uh, long-term wealth creation. You got the flipping for short-term hits of cash and uh, it worked well. So when I combined that with joint venturing, that's when everything uh, took off for me because now I didn't have to wait to earn the money to invest. Mm -hmm. I could just tap into other investors that had the money, but they didn't have the time, knowledge, or desire to be in real estate. Yeah. And so when I combined joint venturing with that strategy, that's how I was able to really scale the portfolio. And how did you find the investors that you were working with uh, for the joint ventures? So again, this comes back to having the confidence in myself to, to lead and, and start a conversation around investing in real estate. Mm -hmm. So you know, in the past, and most people, if they go to a function and someone says, hey, what do you do? I would say, oh, you know, I'm a dealer at the casino and I'd lead with that. Whereas when I was able to build a portfolio and gain confidence in myself, I started, you know, people ask what I do and I would tell them I'm a professional real estate investor. And then the conversation was geared around real estate. Mm -hmm. And many times uh, those conversations would spark interest and curiosity in individuals where they wanted to learn more. And then some of those individuals ultimately became joint venture partners. That's a good point. I, I noticed that that when I, cause I'll, oftentimes I say about 50% of the time I start, I respond with, I'm a real estate investor. And then the other times I say, you know, well, I also own a construction company and you know, I own a few companies for real estate investing, but probably just easier to just say I'm a real estate investor because the yeah the interest there's so much interest in real estate investing people always want to talk about real estate yeah. yeah and taking that one step further is saying not only what I do but what I can do for you yeah. right so if we were having a conversation and we met for the first mm -hmm. time I might say you know I help young men like yourself attain financial independence through real estate right so now if you're somebody that wants that you're going to have further questions for me and that can start a whole conversation around yeah. um you know whether working with me or helping you do it on your own i like what you said with you know just creating creating the goal and, and something to drive you and then also becoming the person you need to be to get that result i think that's the number one thing that people miss and what you missed and i missed when i when i got started is that the number one thing that needs to happen is i as a person need to grow I as a person need to become better because right. if I'm the better person, the better person wins and the better person finds a way to get it done. Right. So I love hearing that reminder. And I think a lot of people on the podcast should take that as a gold nugget is, you know, sometimes maybe even just asking like, you know, what kind of person would I need to be or act like in order to accomplish Absolutely. this? Yeah. So put another way, when I stopped investing in real estate, my real estate portfolio skyrocketed when i was trying to invest in real estate mm -hmm. it was small and struggling you know one step yeah. forward two steps back because the difference was when i stopped investing in real estate and started taking my money to invest it in my self-education 
Now I was able to gain the confidence, the connections and the strategies yes. to go out and raise capital. So there is no limit on my ability to buy real estate. Whereas before I was always trying to, you know, save my money in order to buy. And that's a long, slow, hard process that's not scalable. Absolutely. And I, I can relate with what you're saying because I've done, you know, I have uh, worked with partners in one way or another. And um, primarily what I have is all, all on my own now. Actually, everything I have now is all on my own. And um, it is slower. Yeah, you could say, hey, I own this and, and the equity number is nice and big and, and you're not sharing it. And so it's easier logistically. But what you've been able to do, like how many units are you at right now? Well, so at our peak between, because I have a management company as well. Okay. So at our peak, we were at about 250 doors. 250 doors. Uh, and 150 of those which were owned through um, joint ventures and, and partnerships of okay. some varying degree with so different you, owner different owner percentage ships. Yeah. So you set up joint ventures. I'm guessing that the partner that comes in brings the money and goes on the mortgage and you do the work. Is that is that the... Essentially, yeah. 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 And yeah. that's that's the never ending model right there. If uh, you know, because there's plenty of people there that work professional jobs, don't know about real estate and don't want to go through what Jeff and I went through <laughs> yeah. and get burned real bad. Yeah. Uh, you know, I had to learn the hard way. That was my tuition in real estate investing. And um, if you don't want to do that, then uh, you can just basically hire somebody to do it in a, a joint venture. So it's, it's a great strategy. Yeah. So combining uh, really what I have uh, utilized over the years is the joint venture partnerships. Mm -hmm. um, also RSPs, self-directed RSPs has been really or beneficial. private mortgages. Yeah. So private money uh, through self-directed funds or, okay. or through private investors as well. So. so just to clarify that, so you'd approach people and for <coughs> our American listeners, that's kind of like your 401k, you can self-direct it. So we have something equivalent called an RSP and you can self-direct that as an investor to lend somebody a mortgage. Yeah, and that's correct. So, so you've done that. You just worked with some investors and maybe instead of offering a JV, you said, hey, you could, you could lend me this and I'll give you this rate. Yeah, exactly. So, and yeah. giving them the option, do you want equity in the deal mm -hmm. or do you just want to earn interest on your money? Right. right? So that's good too. Because yeah. when you give people options, they always feel compelled <laughs> to take one. That's right. It's, it's thinking about either or versus yeah. yes or no. That's why I want right? to start. I haven't done this yet, but I want to start presenting two <laughs> offers when I go to buy a house. Here's oh. offer one. Here's offer two. Which would you prefer? It's a, it's a great strategy. And I was listening to, I think it was John on uh, episode 28. Yes. So when you guys were talking about yeah. this uh, same thing. So yeah. can I give you a, a real life scenario of how yes, I've implemented please that? Please do. Okay. So uh, there was, this was a few years ago, but there was a triplex in Chippewa, small little uh, area just outside of Niagara Falls. Okay. And so went to look at the deal and met the owners there. So... I, and I love when the owners are there to show you through the property because then you can really get more information. So, you know, the first part of the conversation is talking about the building improvements and so on and so forth. But as we went through the tour, uh, the lady of the house was doing most of the talking and she started to share uh, her personal life. So they lived in the back uh, main floor unit and the other two units were vacant. Mm hmm. She went on to say that she had two adult children. They each had their own space. They moved out to go to university. They weren't coming back home. She never had any intentions of being a landlord. Mm -hmm. So that's why they wanted to sell. And she wanted to take her profits from that deal and buy her forever home. She didn't want to have to move anymore. Okay. But she also expressed that she didn't want to worry about selling and putting her valuable possessions into storage or being rushed into finding a deal that uh, really yeah. wasn't for her. So she wanted that. And so as we were talking, she was sharing that with me. So I said, okay. I went back and I said, how can I utilize this to create a, a multiple deal uh, situation? So what I did is I submitted one offer that was a higher purchase price, but a short closing. I yeah. want to close really fast. The other offer was a lower purchase price, but a long-term closing. She could essentially pick the the date of her yeah. closing uh, because for me it didn't matter if it closed in one month three months six months um so she then took both of those uh offers and ultimately accepted the deal with the lower purchase price but having the uh, long-term closing and, and this was a private 
uh, sales? No, this, this was actually through realtors. It was on the market through yeah, realtors. Yeah, okay. yeah. And so the, the realtor even said to her, so she was comparing like, which deal do I like best? And the realtor even said like, you can counter this offer, right? And she's like, yeah, I know, but I like that Jeff listened to me and he's giving me the, the time to really mm-hmm. shop the market and find my uh, home. So there was no pressure yeah. on her. So she accepted the lower offer just because I was able to fulfill one of her concerns. So, wow. Yeah. That's awesome. So, so it works. So would you say like looking back at that deal, obviously it was all on market. What did you get it for? And what did you think she could get if she just waited? Well, we got it for, um, so that, again, this is quite a few years ago, so the numbers are a little skewed. They're different now. But uh, I think we purchased that for 146 Okay. Right? And she probably could have got somewhere in the 160s. Okay, so you're 170-ish. 20K in your pocket kind of thing right off the bat, or at least in your equity instantly. That's right, yeah. And that's, yeah. A, that's a nice place to be. And, and also because the two front units were vacant and they were moving out of the back units, so then we could go in fix them up and then crank the rents up as well. So, mm-hmm. you know, it was a really good, uh, really good deal for us. Turnover is great. Yeah. Especially yeah, these days with how much rents are going up, market rents just keep going up like crazy. Yeah. We just had, uh, I'll give you another uh, example of turnover. So this is one of our fourplexes in Welland and, and I love long-term tenants. I had a, a lady that was in the property for a little over 20 years. She was long there, there long before we ever bought it. And she was a wonderful tenant, but her rent was uh, 600 bucks a month, Mm -hmm. right? And so it's hard to get those tenants out. And unfortunately, her mother had passed away. She inherited uh, a home. So she she ended up moving out recently. And we took that same unit, put it back on the market and re-rented it for 1400. Oh man, that's awesome. And it was already cash flowing before. So now we just increased on that one unit an extra $800 per month. I've uh, I've often said time heals all wounds with uh, with real estate, but I I don't know about all wounds, but uh, most of them time yeah. time will heal yeah, and, and sure. make things that much better. Um, yeah, I, I told the story the other day, but I had uh, just turned over one. It was at thirteen twenty five tenants, had, or sorry, thirteen fifty. It was thirteen twenty five originally, and I did the two percent increases for the last few years. Got it up to like maybe it was like thirteen seventy um, at the very end. There they left finally, and uh, eighteen ninety five now. Nice. That's, can't complain about that, right? You know, no, just like a absolutely surge not. of six hundred bucks <laughs> yeah. a month yeah. coming in. So it's you, a beautiful you know, thing. It is. Yeah, that's 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 why real estate anyway. Um I wanted to dig into this a bit more because I, I could see a million different ways we can go on this podcast, which maybe we'll do episodes. Episode two. Yeah. <laughs> um, we'll do a series. We could do a series for sure. So uh, one thing I wanted to ask you is just with goal setting, because this is something I have racked, you know, I've studied and tried many different approaches you know set a goal really big or set a goal reasonable and 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 which is the one you want and then how you refer back to the goals that you set for yourself okay uh great question so how i do my goals is um so i i have the vision i've got the big vision i know what i want in life right and i hold that vision but when i'm setting my goals i break it down into smaller uh, bite-sized actionable steps that I can take mm-hmm. right and so when I set a goal I set it in a gradient right so so what I mean by that is I'll set the first goal um, such that I, I know that I can accomplish that goal based on my past right okay like I feel pretty confident that I can hit that goal and then I'll level that goal up a little bit where it's outside of my comfort zone, okay. right? So it stretches me and then I'll level it up even more where it's a really huge goal mm-hmm. that's outside of what I believe I can do. So when I set my goals in a gradient like that, what it does is it allows me to build momentum and it allows me to gain confidence. And when I build momentum and gain confidence by accomplishing the first part of that gradient, yeah, that that propels me into this, yeah. the second and then ultimately um i'm able to hit those big goals some of the times too positive feedback loop yeah and and the whole thing with the big goal is is just putting it out there right like it it may not happen right away but at least you're putting it out there and you're reinforcing that mindset and that belief system that 
that goal is possible, right? Hey guys, I just wanted to take a moment and pause the podcast real quick and ask you to do a quick favor. If you wouldn't mind, please take a moment and hit that subscribe button if you haven't already. If you're on YouTube, please also hit the uh, like and notification bell. And uh, if you're listening on Apple Podcasts or iTunes or what have you, uh, I'd really appreciate it if you take a moment and review the podcast, rate and review. It helps more people to find it. These podcasts are a lot of work for me, but I do love doing them and I just wanna get them into as many people's hands as I can, and I would really appreciate your help in doing so. Back to the podcast. Okay, so, and I actually have, I've heard of that approach before. I've heard it called something specific, but uh, learned it at a seminar I went to one time. Okay. Uh, I like yeah. that approach, and I almost forgot that I knew that, so that's, that's good. Thanks for reminding me. How did you set your big vision? Because I have things that are on my vision board and things that I, I know are part of it, and then things, even just call it uh, preferential differences between my wife and I and things that, that we want. Um, how you set a vision and, you know, did you, I don't know if you're, if you're married, if you brought your, your partner in on it, um, you know, how, do, how do you go about that? Yeah. So I, I'm not married. I'm single, no children. Okay. Um, that makes it a lot easier. <laughs> yeah. And just for you yeah. being married, you know, what I, what I like to encourage people to do is you have your vision, mm -hmm. your wife has her vision yeah. and then you have your joint vision. Right. Gotcha. So, and then you can support her and her goals and her dreams and vice versa. She can support you. And then sure. you can, you can find that common ground in the middle. Um, so that works well. But for me, uh, I, I just, I, I dream as big as my mindset at the time will allow me to dream. Right. So to give you an example in 2007, when I set that goal of a hundred doors by the time mm -hmm. I'm 65 years old, which thankfully I'm nowhere near 65 as we speak, right? At that point in time, that was a huge astronomical goal that I wasn't sure I could ever hit, right? Like I come, my parents don't own a single property to this day. So how am I going to have a hundred doors and my own company and land down yeah. south and all this stuff, right? So that was huge for me. Now, when I started to break it down into bite-sized actionable steps and just focus on, okay, that's the goal, but how can mm -hmm. I do one at a time, right? I just need to figure out how can I buy one deal at a time. Yeah. And then over time, I'm looking back six years later and I'm like, holy cow, I just crushed my goal, right? So the, the epiphany in that moment was, okay, I crushed my goal in way faster time than I ever believed possible. You know, there was no fireworks. There was no great job. It was just, I crushed the goal. And then I started to really think about, you know, so now I've got a hundred do doors. Yeah. So what? Right. What's like, next? yeah. You got to get excited about something for that though. Right. Yeah. You, you've definitely got to get uh, excited about it, but nothing really shifted. Right. You didn't need to do anything from that point. Once you had a hundred doors, I'm sure you could have orchestrated the cash flow so that you could have just retired right then and there and never worked again. Maybe, maybe I'm wrong. Uh, yeah. Well, f for me, I would, cause again, I think of working differently now. Right. Yeah. So, it's not working in a job that I hate and retiring at 65. It's about doing what you love to do and Absolutely. then continuing to do that. So I'm always yeah. going to uh, be involved in real estate and investing in business in some capacity. Because you but, enjoy the process, right? Yeah, yeah, I enjoy the process and, and um, the growth and all of that wonderful stuff, the challenge of it as well. Mm -hmm. But, you know, there was, there was no, um, it, it wasn't what I thought it would be, right? Like I thought hitting 100 doors for me at that time in 2007 was this astronomical um, event, right? That this huge accomplishment, and it certainly was a huge accomplishment, but I got thinking, you know, what if I had the courage to say a thousand back at that time, right? Yeah. Would, would it be different? And then the other perspective there too that I started to think about is, okay, so I'm at a hundred doors, but why a hundred doors, right? And as you grow and evolve and learn, it's not necessarily about the number of doors. It's about the quality of doors, right? Yeah, I would agree. It's definitely, uh, it's not just about the number of doors. I've focused on quality like crazy in my portfolio, maybe too much. I, I sometimes look at some of my uh, peers in this, you know, in this business and see how many doors they have. And I'm like, well, that sounds a lot cooler. When I, when I say my number, I qualify. I'm like, but you know, the the asset value is more impressive <laughs> yeah but. yeah it's not about necessarily the number of doors it's about the quality of the doors yeah. and more importantly 
Are you building your real estate, real estate investment business in a way that delivers the lifestyle that you desire? Right. Yeah. So I see a lot of investors where they'll start to scale their portfolio, but they build it in such a way where everything revolves around them. Right. They're going to cut the grass. They're going to collect yeah. the, And so they essentially create a second job for themselves. And, and what they really wanted was the financial freedom to do the things they love in life. Yeah. But now they've got a second job. And the properties that they bought, they didn't properly an analyze for expenses like management and maintenance and vacancy rates. Mm -hmm. So when they go to look to a manager to take over, now they've got a negative cash flow that's even worse than, you know, what they originally anticipated. Yeah. So, and again, that just goes back to the education of learning how to do it properly the first time so that you don't make yeah. the mistakes that unfortunately I've made and some of these other people have made, sure. right? So I found what, what worked for me and maybe it was an overcompensation, but a friend of mine that I graduated with, I don't know who his mentor was. He kind of keeps his cards tight to his chest, but um, he's probably at like, I don't know, 30 student rentals. And these are, you know, anywhere from 500 to $800,000 in value uh, a piece. And um, I, I, I don't know his whole story, but I saw him kind of doing it and doing it again. And he was, he was kind enough to kind of share. He would let me like kind of, I would sit in his office sometimes and just listen to him do business. I would do my work and, and kind of started to, to recognize how he thinks. And this was after I got burned in the U S and all that. And I was, I was really starting well during and after, and I was really starting to understand what he looked for, how he looked at it. And it, um, it helped me a lot, but then I just, you know, I was fortunate enough that I actually saw exactly the deals he was doing. So I, I knew tangibly exactly what to do. Yeah. And it just gave me so much confidence knowing somebody and and basically being coached informally. Yeah. To allow me to do Mentorship, that, right? I didn't yeah. I didn't pay him, but he was definitely a mentor to me and and the same way Carmen, my mother-in-law is a mentor to me. I've I've never paid her for coaching, but uh you know, she's she's certainly willing to give me her advice when I ask. So, um yeah. but then again, I all I don't always want to ask these people. So, I you know, that that kind of goes back to the uh the coaching but when i when i mentioned overcompensation is after i got burned i was like i will only do deals where i know i'm gonna win and i will make sure that i got plan a that wins plan b that wins and even plan c that wins or at least breaks even and then i'll do the deal pros and cons to that pros are rarely ever get yourself into trouble cons are do a lot less deals um, yeah. And, you know, when you're looking at the deal and analyzing them, having multiple exit strategies too. Mm -hmm. Right. So that's the A, B and C, right? Like yeah, yeah. if you think, well, I could, you know, buy and sell this one. I did that in my, my company earlier this year. I had one that I, I would, you know, built an addition, a uh, secondary dwelling unit. And I'm like, well, I'll sell it. But if I don't get the number that I want, I'm just going to keep it. And, and I'll wait, you know, year, two years, maybe I'll sell it down or maybe I'll just keep it forever. Yeah, I don't like selling stuff. <laughs> it's nice to be in that position though, right? Like if you yeah. get, you know, top dollar for your deal, then maybe you'll yeah. part ways with it. If not, just carry it and let it cash flow. Everything's for sale at the right price. That's right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> let the tenants pay the mortgage down. Yeah. Appreciation goes up. Yeah. I'm, and this is maybe a good segue into a different conversation, but I am genuinely um, concerned for Ontario right now. And my main reasoning for the concern is the cost of building materials. It all starts there. I know people think housing prices is just going up. This is all driven from the cost of building new homes. And it started with, well, it started a long, long time ago. But in recent years, we had the minimum wage bump, which bumped everything else. And, and then we had new tariffs and taxes put on all kinds of things, including aluminum, lumber, um, different things coming into the country. So everything from my perspective and having renovated, and I'm sure you've seen it too, like when you're renovating stuff, wow, from five years ago, you know, lumber's almost double. Yeah. Uh, things like that. We didn't see a doubling of wages in the last five years. Right. So I would say it's probably cost about 30 to 50% more to build today than it did five years ago. Mm -hmm. We just haven't seen that growth in income. So our country is kind of pushing itself and stretching the middle class a little bit right now. So the idea of selling anything scares me because I think that we're going to a day where no one owns, uh, almost no one owns, and it's all, it's a, f uh, a few investors and 90% renters. So we have 10% maybe investors owning homes and 90% um, people renting them, which I, I think that, you know, there is precedent for that. You can look at England, you can look at different things. And I know I've talked about this on the podcast, but I just wanted to give you the context to see what you think, because I know you're in this business 
and you're seeing a lot of stuff and I know you're primarily holding um well you know, what are your thoughts well we we do sell as well you right? do sell yeah okay. so we've again throughout the course of you know the last 20 years in real estate I do primarily the buy, fix, refi, rent strategy. Okay. Um, but we do flips as well, and yeah, you know, and we'll sell off some deals. And now, you know, we're uh, in the position where we're able to enjoy the fruits of our labor. You know, yeah. like my first property I bought for sixty nine thousand, right? Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, that's worth three times uh, now what I paid for it, right? If not significantly more. So, um, so yeah, we're able to enjoy the the fruits of our labor and we're selling off some of our deals based mm-hmm. on what we want to do. Cause again, holding true to the vision, part of my vision is to be able to uh, live down South for okay. uh, at least six months of the year. Um, so I'm looking to, you know, deploy some of my capital and earnings down there yeah. and, and acquire condos and enjoy the good life and, and perhaps uh, explore duplicating yeah. uh, the business that I've created here down South and, and leverage into vacation okay. rentals. So, so you would flip down there, or, or run and manage, own and manage uh, vacation rentals, or something along those lines. Or yeah. Both? Well, the primary focus is uh, a place for enjoyment, R and R. Yeah. Um, to get away and and just relax and enjoy, you know, the the fruits of my labor after investing mm-hmm. and working for for twenty years and building up the portfolio. So you always, for me, I'm a a big fan of celebrating the journey, Mm -hmm. right? Sometimes we get so caught up in the monotony of building the portfolio and the work and the hustle, right? The Gary V stuff and hustle, hustle, hustle. And uh, I think it's important that we stop and celebrate and enjoy um, life as well. So that's, that's big for me. I agree completely. That's that's why I work from home. We shoot this podcast from my uh, my basement dungeon. Absolutely, uh, <laughs> and and perhaps the next uh, the next one could be down south, right? So yeah, yeah. I just gotta pack the up series. the equipment. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's, it's it definitely doable. Yeah. Um, I guess where where I was going with my rant from before, yeah, was, we got off track a little bit. There. It, it was it, it's more just I look at every day that passes as like another day that I didn't buy a property. If I didn't buy a property that day, and um, I see this market changing so quickly because we have so much immigration and and people need a place to live. Yeah. It almost seems like insanity to sell stuff. And I'm not saying I don't. I've sold many properties. Mm-hmm. It's just I look back at them. I'm like, I would have made a lot more if I just kept it. You know, it, the, how much extra it's worth. I could just refinance it at, at this point. Gra- ga- granted, there's a need because it was part of my income strategy and still is to occasionally sell a property. Um, I, I like to keep as much as I can, but occasionally I'll sell one too. Yeah. I mean, for me, it's finding that happy mm-hmm. medium of you, mm-hmm. you want to keep cherry pick your best deals and mm-hmm. hold those long term, sell off some yeah. deals for short term profit and to live your desired lifestyle now. Mm-hmm. Right. So it's finding that happy medium that uh, delivers the lifestyle that you desire. Right. So at the end of the day, it's not about, you know, you know, when the, the end comes for you, God forbid, mm-hmm. being able to say, yeah, I've got 100 doors or 200 doors or 500 doors. It's about enjoying your life. And, and what's the whole reason of building that portfolio and that business if you can't then utilize that cash flow uh, for for your lifestyle? Yes. And I agree with that completely. I, I do follow a lot of people who are into the whole um fire movement, financial independence, retire early or lean fire, which is basically just where you basically live on food stamps and, and yeah, your rental I, properties pay for what you need. <laughs> yeah. I'm not about living on food stamps. I, I like to go out. I like to, yeah. you know, eat out and enjoy travel. Right. Um, so I w- still want to maintain a quality of life. Yeah. Um, but at the same point in time, you know, you I keep some of my deals for long term. I'm building that long term wealth. Yeah. accumulation but i'm also liquidating deals for for capital that i need today and and i'm also sure. once you know when i'm selling a deal uh part of the strategy is you know can i take that capital and redeploy it into a bigger better deal mm-hmm. right so i might sell a property that's underperforming a little bit to go into a bigger deal that makes a lot of sense times like that it would really benefit to be able to do that 1031 exchange the Americans can do. Yeah, they've got some advantages that I'd love to see 
you know, duplicated here in Canada, but unfortunately, I've heard that it was a it was a discussion. It just it didn't happen. Didn't but happen. Uh, man, would that be wonderful? So yeah. that would just basically prevent us from paying tax on um, on an investment if we rolled it, it rolled that money into a new investment within the same year. Uh, puts the pressure on you to to find a new deal. So yeah, yeah um, absolutely. Want to change gears a little bit? I was wondering if we could talk about a deal that you've done, whether it be a buy, fix, rent, refinance, or it be a flip, um, something you found that the numbers look great, you know, feel free to choose one that comes to mind, a recent deal that you've done. Okay, sure. I'll, uh, just back of the envelope numbers. You don't need specifics. Yeah, We'll (laughs) we'll talk approximate. I always do. Yeah, I've analyzed so many deals that the, all the numbers blur, but I'll give you one deal that, um, that comes to mind. Uh, and again, um, so this was a, a 17 unit apartment building okay. in, uh, St. Catharines. It ultimately became a flip. So, but again, going back to multiple exit strategies mm-hmm. could have done uh buy, fix, refi rent. We, we ended up keeping it for about 18 months or so, but, okay. um, I'll give you a little bit of the details. So, it was on the market for 799,000. So again, this is okay. a couple years ago before the huge sure. spike in values. Um, so 799,000, uh, got it under contract for 825,000. Okay. Uh, there was at that price point, a lot of interest in the deal. It was owned by an, an out of town gentleman. I think he was out of Toronto who, uh, I think got in over his head and the building became overran by delinquent tenants, drug mm-hmm. dealers. And, um, he hired a contracting crew that, uh, did a horrible job and the building became a nightmare for him. So out of 17 units, uh, 14 were vacant and the three that were occupied were not desirable tenants. So, okay. uh, we were able to then get it under contract for 825. What I did was I brought all my contract uh, connections and my team through the property. So rather than getting a formal inspection, I just bring the electrician, bring the roofer, bring my entire crew through, uh, went through and got not only what needed to be done, but the pricing on what it would cost, took that information back to the seller and then was able to renegotiate the purchase price and got it for seven forty. Ooh, amazing! So we we're able to knock a significant amount of money off the uh, the price, and then even the financing was a little bit creative on this deal too. Um, again, going back to your last podcast with John, we used a vendor take back as well. Okay. So we came up with fifteen percent down. Vendor uh, held ten percent mortgage for us and then the bank financing for the rest. So then what we did is we quickly went to work to renovate all all 17 units, get rid of the bad tenants, mm-hmm. and refill the building. Uh, we were able to do that in about 18 months. It cost us about, like holding costs and renovation, cost about uh, 200000 Not bad, okay. Okay, so, so we're in for... Nine nine forty ish nine forty nine fifty yeah okay so nine forty and then we're able to sell it for one point three five million wow so that's that's an example of you know one deal I did that um, now of course not all deals are gonna start there I started a lot smaller with you know single family homes and duplexes yeah. and triplexes and so on that one uh, you had some partners in on that yes. So how many ways are you splitting that uh, three hundred and sixty thousand dollar profit? Uh, three ways. Three ways. That's yeah. that's a nice chunk either way though. Yeah. How much yeah, of your time well. would you say that 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 took? So so that's the key, right? Yeah. So when I'm doing my deals, I'm not. The, I don't want to be the general contractor. I'm not installing the tiles or mm-hmm. I'm doing none of that, right? I'm yep. I'm finding the deal, negotiating the deal, putting it together, and then I'm bringing in my team of professionals to. Um, to renovate the deal. I'm overseeing the process, yep. right? Uh, and then when it comes to management, I've got my manager that fills it and does all the due diligence with the leases and all that sort of thing. So my time in the deal is is very limited. I do a similar approach. I, uh, I don't have a formal property manager anymore, but I have like maintenance people and a rental agent that just kind of 
work yeah. off each other and I try to get involved in little batches. If you yep. have a problem, you email me and I'll deal with it in a timely manner. If you have an emergency, call the other person. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's the, that's the way to do it. Otherwise you go insane. Yeah. And you'll feel it. Right. I felt it. I just, I grew, I grew, I grew. And I'm like, what did I just do? And um, I actually know a guy who uh, he, uh, he invests and in, he's doing a ton of joint ventures in London. And uh, they were on pace uh, to do a very large number this year and, uh, you know, hit, I don't know, I think they're somewhere around their halfway point. And uh, just realizing just how much in the logistics of things to go from, you know, they had never done that pace before. Um, and I've heard that from a lot of people, you know, when you, when you try and grow too fast, you're just like, whoa, yeah, <laughs> I got to get some systems in place. Otherwise I'm going to, I'm not going to be able to sleep at night. Yeah. And I've certainly yeah. made that mistake before, uh, yeah. like scaling too fast, but back to management, you yeah. know, most new investors, when they think of management, they think they're either going to self manage yeah. or they're going to outsource and hire a management company. And option three, which is what we ultimately did is we hired an in-house manager, trained her to manage the way we want yeah. and then built the systems around her. So, so now not only do we have, um, our properties managed at a very affordable rate because it's all in house, yeah. which then allows us to give a better um, deal to our, our investors, right? Because okay. we're keeping their expenses down, profits higher. And, and also we're leveraging that into another income stream because now we can take on other people's properties too. So you are actively so, managing other people's properties as well. Yeah, not me personally, but your company. my company. Yes. yes. Yeah. Uh, the I don't, key. No, not yeah, me. <laughs> not me. Yeah, don't call me. And, and uh and I make it, you know, very clear that uh yeah, I own the company, I do not do the management. So I I delegate all that stuff and um yeah. just oversee it. Yeah. Well, that's the right way to do it. Jeff, I think it's a good time to to bring up the book. Uh so the ultimate wealth strategy, when did you write this? Uh I think about 5 years ago or so five years ago yeah. and uh if you had to give me a synopsis uh a quick little one what's uh what's it about so essentially it, it i co-authored the book with uh andrew brennan and quinton de who are mm -hmm. also other uh, great real estate investors here in ontario canada and essentially it's a strategy strategy that all three of us used and the way i like to describe it is it's a hybrid of flipping property yeah. and long-term buy and holds so you essentially buy a property, fix it up, get it rented out. And then rather than selling yeah. it like a flip, you would refinance it, get all or the majority of your capital back and then hold that property long term. Okay. Um, so it's basically walks you through that entire strategy from start to finish. And it gives you a breakdown of several examples on smaller deals, scaling up into the bigger deals. Okay. Um, and, uh, the nice thing about the book is it's written in a story format. So sometimes, you know, yeah. analyzing numbers can get a little boring and, and monotonous. So it is in, in a story format, which is uh, kind of entertaining as well. So I can imagine that would be motivating too, right? You need to get a little charged up. Sometimes I always, I just like seeing case studies. It gets, gets yeah. me fired up. That's that's yeah. one of the big reasons why on this podcast, I try and do a case study on everyone. Like, tell me about a deal you did. And, you know, yes. what was it? Uh, obviously a 17 unit apartment. A lot of people aren't there, but some people are. And, and you know, they're looking for the next move and, and you know, maybe that uh, that helps them do it. And um, so, yeah, there's definitely real world case studies in there of deals that um, all three of us have done uh, in Ontario, Canada. So, so uh, yeah, so I think it's a great book. I'm a little bit biased, but <laughs> just, a, uh, just a little bit. Yeah. 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 So I, I, I've had the chance to, to meet Quentin and I know he does. Um, he does a lot of duplex conversions. Yes. Um, you know, I, so we call that on this show a lot. The burr, you know, well, not the duplex conversion, but when you buy reno refinance, yeah. uh, rent it and repeat. Uh, people have a lot of different ways to saying that flip to yourself, buy, fix, rent, refinance, yes. um, whatever you call it, just, you know, just make money and good equity and, and you'll That's be fine. Right. Yeah. Um, so, okay. So it's basically the story of, of how it all worked. How did you, uh, how did you come into, into contact with those guys? Uh, well, I met Quinton through a networking group, uh, based out of Toronto and we just got chatting and discovered we had a lot of things in common and you know we're implementing the same strategies he he is focused in uh, oshawa um durham region okay and uh and i was focused in hamilton niagara so we just uh started to chat and got to know each other and and then came up with the idea of uh, writing the book and it was quinton who introduced me to andrew 
Um, and so that's how the, okay. the idea kind of formed. And then ever since then, we've wrote the book together and, uh, you know, we'll keep in touch and, and collaborate. Yeah. And we've done some seminars together teaching the strategy as well. So Well, it's a huge credibility piece. I know, I, I believe Quentin does offer coaching as well. I'm not, I'm not completely sure. Yes. But I mean, as far as coaching goes, when you're author of a real estate investing book, that definitely doesn't hurt uh, as far as that goes. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so so some tangibles because I know we haven't gone into too many uh, tangible uh, strategies uh, for people today who wanted to invest. Uh, you know, call it Ontario, even call it you know in your your target area, so that Niagara, Welland, St. Catharines area. Um, how do you find a good buy uh, buy fix rent refinance project now? Um, how are you seeing the numbers work out? How much are people typically in for if they're doing those deals down there? So they, they're uh, definitely much more challenging now than when I was really scaling my portfolio. Mm-hmm. So much harder to find. I find a lot of uh, a lot of my coaching students now are gearing more towards the legal secondary suites, mm-hmm. especially in Welland because the city is uh, really great to uh, to work with as far as permits and getting things done. So they're having a lot of success in that strategy. So. Um, they're doing more of that and, and then you have to really be selective and find the right deal that, you know, uh, meets the investment criteria to really pull off a, a solid buy, fix, refi and, and rent strategy. It can be done, yeah. but it's a, it's a lot more challenging to find and you have to be a little bit more patient in today's market, especially if you're working with realtors and only looking on MLS. Yeah. Right. So if you're, if you're going that road, it's going to be a challenge for you. Uh, However, if you're able to use some creative uh, off-market strategies and find off-market deals, I've found over the years, that's where I get a lot of my uh, really good deals from as well. Um, And so then the opportunity presents itself a little bit uh, Like with with flyering, which I uh, I have done myself. The flyers, the bandit signs, the, Mm -hmm. the yellow letters, right? Sending out all, you know, social media. Just putting it out there that you you know you see that we buy properties cash. Yeah. Um, so we've been able to do uh, quite a few amazing yeah. deals with that as well. The key with those, I think, just from my own personal experience, is putting in the, the time with the leads you get and and working a deal with them. Mm-hmm. I uh, made the mistake of doing it right before uh, my wedding, the same month as my wedding. Oh, okay. Pressure was on. <laughs> Pressure was on. I got uh, I got like five hundred calls. <laughs> And I didn't have uh, adequate help for that. So I uh, definitely didn't take advantage of the, the leads the way I, I wanted to. Um, I was able to monetize on a bit of it, but uh, I've, I've learned a few lessons about how I would adjust my approach for that next time. Yeah. And um, I mean, it, it really does work if you if you implement it consistently, you can generate yeah. a ton of leads, ton of leads. especially yeah. in that. I, that's one of those things where I know I need to work on myself and how I speak with people in in that position, right? It's not that I haven't sold anything before, but it's a very unique circumstance and I need to, I know that that there's a lot of room for growth for me personally, just in working the details and when, you know, somebody says no, or I want this, how to massage that into a solution that works for everybody and uh, and get more deals done, so. Yeah, and having access to, you know, various strategies and yeah. the right connections and private money and, it just allows you to do uh, so many more deals, right? Yeah. So, and I think that just comes with the education and yep. the time and the experience. So, yeah. So, I think that probably uh, will segue into the next question, which is, uh, what would you suggest to someone uh, as the number one important thing that they do? And I think you're going to say, educate yourself. Yeah. Uh, so, what's one thing you'll tell them not to do? What not to do? Try and do it on your own. <laughs> yeah. So. Double, uh, two, yeah, two sides yeah, to that coin. Sword. No, you know what? I, I, I get that a fair bit from, from people who, um, some people who, who, uh, who really have, have spoken about the value of education on the podcast. Like, it's like, number one thing to do, get educated. Number one thing not to do is don't because they've seen it, right? You had a, you had a dramatic event, you got burned, you knew like the, this, this happened because I didn't get educated yeah. because I bit off way more than I was capable of chewing. And uh, hey, we all learn that way. So I agree with you 100%. And and the other thing is the wasted time too, right? Like if you look at my personal journey, Mm -hmm. I started in 98, but I really didn't, you know, hit my stride running till 2007. 
that's a lot of wasted years. Yeah. So if we look at today's market, and as you alluded to before, where prices are just going up and up and up and up, and every day that goes by, you're upset you didn't buy a deal, mm-hmm. right? Well, if you're if you're wasting all that time, that's again opportunity that you, yes, you know, is is gone, right? So, I uh, I did a television appearance on uh, Thirty Minutes to Wealth, and I, I actually gave that example of, you know, if 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 you wanted to buy, say, a property that was five hundred thousand dollars and you needed to save twenty percent you know how many years for the average person saying living in toronto or or whatever you know if they're they're paying high rents high cost of living how many years will it take you to save that down payment exactly versus if you already had your home and you could put a private mortgage on it and find a way to buy that other property today now you start benefiting from day one from appreciation because if you wait the five to ten years it takes to save the down payment that property that was 500 is now 800 exactly and that's no fun yeah (laughs) i would rather the three hundred thousand dollars in equity belong to me yeah so it's just about getting in the game and and i think when you surround yourself with people that have done it 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 gives you the the confidence to go out there and do it as well and yes you know and back to saving time you Mm -hmm. don't have to figure out you know who to connect with they can share their connections and resources with you so for me that's been the the best investment by far yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. And I, start, I started the Greater Hamilton REI meetup uh, here in town, if you can stick around oh, it's tonight. Nice. Um, but uh, maybe you can come to an, another one if you can't. Yeah, but, I'll definitely uh, come check one out. I can't tonight, yeah. but yeah, yeah. Well, you know, it's exactly for that reason, right? Like the amount of guys there that are doing this kind of thing. Uh, I've had many of them on the podcast. They come, like John uh, was at the last meetup, and that's why I asked him. I'm like, hey, you want to come on the podcast next time you're here? Yeah, yeah. And uh the amount of learning, like meet a contractor, meet, you know, they, they just cut the amount of time you would need to do something in half or even less. And, uh, yeah, it's amazing. So yeah, yeah, that's, I would definitely agree with you there. Uh, okay. So a couple more things about you, uh, when you're not doing all this real estate stuff, what is your number one idea of fun? Travel, 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 different adventures, different countries, different cultures. What's your favorite country so far? Uh, I like a lot of them. Uh, I was in Medellin, Colombia, not too long ago. Okay. That was uh, a really interesting experience. Got to be uh, careful down there. <laughs> yeah, like yeah. everywhere you go, you got to be yeah. careful. But um, just mingling and experiencing different cultures. So yeah, yeah. Uh, Colombia, uh, Roatan, beautiful island off the coast of uh, Honduras. Okay. Uh, so that's nice. I was just in Dominican Republic, um, and, and again, these are countries that i'm kind of looking into for investment as well yeah. uh, do you so, like warm weather and you're done with with our winters yeah that's right and so if i got an excuse to yeah. you know if i gotta look at real estate it's not bad yeah. to, to be on a tropical island looking at it right so that's a tax deductible flight down as well if you got real estate sure down, yeah right? you can get yeah, some travel uh, travel perks yeah i'm not an accountant but uh yeah. I, I would find a way uh working with my accountant to make that one pass yeah um yeah, absolutely okay. Uh, yeah. What's your uh, favorite food? Favorite food? Um, well, I like sushi. Sushi's mm-hmm. good. Uh, Italian, a little bit of Italian. Okay. Yeah, I like lots of uh, lot. Again, I like just trying different cultural dishes yeah. and experiencing new things. So, yeah, yeah I'll try anything uh, once. So fair enough. Yeah, fair yeah. enough. Yeah, yeah. To some degree, I can relate. I do like to to go see different places, try different food. I eat vegan, so it makes it a little harder to a little uh, more challenging. Yeah, Italy was hard <laughs> trying. I, all I ate was like pasta with pasta, tomato sauce. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah. I, I was happy to go. Actually, by the fifth day there, I'm like, I can't do this anymore. Yeah. But uh, yeah, usually I can figure figure my way out. Um, okay, so if someone would like to get a, a hold of you, what's the best way for them to do that? I think the best way is to just go to my website, okay. which is uh, jeffreywoods.com. Okay. And it's spelled J E F F E R Y. Um, most people spell okay. it R E Y. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. My parents threw a little twist in there. So it's good. Um, most people spell it incorrectly the first time. However, I was able to buy my domain name because nobody had that spelling. So. That's perfect. So that's good. So yeah. Yeah. So I'll uh, I'll put that in the show notes. Um, so that's how how you'll get a hold of Jeff. If you'd like to get a hold of me, my uh, contact details will be there as well. Uh, best places to get a hold of me are commenting in a YouTube video, or you can DM me on Instagram, and and uh, my handle will be there. Um, okay. So Jeff, I really appreciate you coming on. Like I Thank said, you. I know we can go, we can go a lot of ways yeah, with this. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we'll chat again. And then if, if uh, maybe we'll have an idea of what we could do on another episode and we'll do another one. 
Yeah, be, uh, sounds good. Be fun. Yeah, All I right. love talking with uh, like-minded people, so it's always enjoyable. Yeah, same. That's that's why I do this. Get, yeah, because it gives me a boost, right? Every every time I get to sit down and see how you look at things and compare that to how I look at and see what I can I can learn from that. That's uh, it's yeah. fun, right? Yeah, build connections and relationships. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, it's wonderful. Awesome. Well, we'll see you on the next one. Thanks, All right, Jeff. great. Thank you, Andrew.